Uh oh, it's is it working? Yeah. Do, does um, SVP have anything they need to say before we start our very last class? Nothing that's required, but Dr. Bula, thank you so much. So happy to be here. And um, this is our final session, as, as uh, Dr. Bula just said. Um, moving forward, you know, we'll see what, what's to come. And yeah, I don't really have anything else uh, other than that of like, you know, this has been such a wonderful experience. And Yolanda, do you have anything that you'd like to just kind of throw in to the space? Yolanda's over there handling all the tech stuff, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm so sorry about that. I'm trying to get the our ASL interpreter on. Um, I was finishing up a call like right as we got started. So I'm like trying to get myself together. Um, but um, Dr. Abdullah, it has been amazing and it's been a privilege. I, I think I came into this course of like, you're going to teach us all this history. And you were like, no, we're not about history. We're going to talk about that, but we're going to talk about what you're going to do right now for Black Power. Right. And I have appreciated that so, That's so much. Right. Yeah, well, thank you. It's been um, great for me. And um, I guess I could have done some more history than I did. <laughs> but it is a bad thing. I totally appreciate it. But I have loved you making us focus on victories, because that's really important to think of when you're in the struggle for Black power and liberation for everyone that you can get discouraged. So I've so appreciated the what is it the um just just everything and think about like what what is going to be your thing but then how do you also care about other things as well and like what you can do right now to move what you care about forward right well thank you for that grounding Yolanda and we're gonna um uh, actually maybe we'll pick up on that a little bit before we get into what I planned um, for us to do today. And um, this has been a really great partnership for me. Thank you all both for reaching out and for making this class possible. Thank you to Pro Bono ASL for being our partners in this. Um, we're really grateful and grateful for everybody who's joined and um, has become involved in work um, through this effort. And so I want to not forget to start with our um, start with our grounding. Every what is this one? This is weird. I don't know what that is. I want to start with our grounding and um, want to get somebody who can read the first slide of our land, labor, and life acknowledgement before we get into the conversation. Is there someone who can start us? I'll start. Um, this is Chastity. I apologize. I've been gone the last two weeks, so I'm happy that I'm here for the last class. So um, if we could start by just taking a deep breath in and out. This land that we inhabit is physically situated in the original ancestral homelands of the Tongva people. We pay respect to the Tongva and all indigenous people, past, present, and future and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout their historical diaspora. Thank you. And who can do the next slide? Or who will do the next slide? I'm happy to. Let's go ahead and ground ourselves, feet flat on the ground and take a deep breath in together and exhale with sound. <sighs> we pay homage to those who were stolen from Africa, placed in bondage, falsely named as chattel, and forced into labor who were called slaves, but never submitted as such, who have always been fully human with an unbroken connection to the divine and to each other, 
we honor our African ancestors for the still unpaid labor which built what is now the Americas. Thank you. And who will do our last slide? I can do one it. One more person. I can do it. Yes. Um, can everyone take a breath in? And out. To both our indigenous and African forebears, we commit to the continued struggle for liberation and reparations, for it is only through freedom and justice that we truly give honor. Aho, ashe. Thank you. Thank you, everybody who read. Um, I want to get into the victories and then we're going to get into a conversation. I, had, I struggled to find victories this week. I had to really think and consult with Tyler what were the victories this week. And then I just kind of went through my agenda and came up with three. Um, but I wanna talk about the struggle of identifying victories in just a second. So the three that I um, lift up in here are that we celebrated the life of Chip, Chip Fitzgerald. Chip Fitzgerald was um, one of the longest serving political prisoners. He um, did, what was it, 51 years? 57, was it 57 or 51 years in Lancaster prison and was one of the youngest um, Black Panthers to be incarcerated. And um, he died in prison at the age of 71. And um, we gathered with Panthers from all around the country. There were a couple of hundred people, including Black Lives Matter organizers, including youth organizers, and anchored by Black Panthers from all around the country. Um, the, some of the folks who were there were um, one of my babas, Hank Jones, who was one of the San Francisco Eight, um, Sekou Odinga, who was a political prisoner himself, um, as was Baba Hank, um, but Sekou Odinga did 37 years for liberating Asada Shakur from prison in New York. Um, there were lots of folks who flew in to honor Chip Fitzgerald. But what was really beautiful is that the gathering um, brought these multi-generations of freedom fighters together to really build a really beautiful energy and recommit ourselves to struggle. And so um, being able to contribute to that was really, really important. And if you want to see how it went, um, it is up on our Instagram um, at Black Lives Matter, um, BLK Lives Matter on Instagram. We also closed New Black City. We had a grand closing ceremony um, with libation and song and poetry and food and just really brilliant um, uh, contributions and loving energy. And it was powerful. And so we did that on Sunday. And then last night, we got the LA Democratic Party to call for the resignation of Sheriff Alex Villanueva. So if you have been paying attention, you know Villanueva is, um, they call him the Trump of LA. He's really kind of a terrible person in addition to being a terrible sheriff. It's very, um, it's, it's saying something to say he's the worst sheriff in the history of Los Angeles, considering we have uh, Lee Baca and others that were his predecessors. Um, and so um, we got the LA Democratic Party to call for his resignation, which is another victory. Um, but as we get to your victories, one of the things that came to me as I struggled to identify victories is that I'm in the midst, I find myself in the midst of struggle, right? Like I'm engaged in struggle right now, like leading up to this class, I'm 
thrown off kilter because some website tried to scam me for $218. And, you know, it's, it's those little things, right? It's those little things. And it has me flustered that I still haven't figured out how to get my money back. And, um, you know, it's not the biggest scam in the world, but it's still, you know, those kinds of things frustrate you, right? And then there are ongoing struggles. We're struggling. Um, I did a press conference this morning around Measure J, and I know many of you were involved in the effort to get Measure J passed, and we won in LA County by a landslide. Measure J, which says invest in things like housing and health care and mental health care and reentry programs and um, small businesses and education and youth programs and that money should be taken out of things like jails the largest jail system in the world and the sheriffs who we just mentioned is the one of the most problematic um, so-called law enforcement units on the planet right but the struggle is so constant. We won Measure J, so we thought. We won by a landslide. It should have been a billion dollars that we're looking at for the programs that I just mentioned. But what we're seeing is a county CEO who says that there's only $100 million a year, $100 million this year for Measure J. It should have been far more than that. It should have been many hundreds of millions of dollars, right? this year for Measure J, right? And um, we're finding that we have to constantly fight. And so we had to have this press conference about how they're trying to shortchange Measure J when the voters of Los Angeles County said, this is what we wanna fund. We're also in the midst of a fight around the city budget. You all know that we launched People's Budget LA um, just a few months before the murder of George Floyd, just as this, pandemic kicked in. And what we're seeing is we had a pledge from the mayor, soon to be former mayor of the city, that $150 million would be cut from LAPD and $250 million invested in Black community. And what we've seen is not a penny of that money went through Black organizations for the benefit of Black community, um, that he is actually seeking to fund a white-led organization that's new from San Francisco um, to do that to do that work. Um, we're also seeing that he's restoring, and the city council unanimously supported his budget, which restores about forty million dollars to LAPD. He's seeking to hire um, two hundred fifty more LAPD officers when we know that LAPD continues to kill folks, continues to brutalize folks, continues to profile folks. Um, we just jumped off, I just jumped off an Instagram live where I witnessed this terrible sheriff, Alex Villanueva, blame unhoused people for being unhoused and actually saying things like, go back to where you came from. And as a black woman, right, who knows what it means when people say, go back to where you came from, go back to Africa or go back, right? There's really so much embedded in that language. And so he talked about how so many people choose this lifestyle and that they need to clean up uh, Venice Beach and they need to clean up downtown. And so I'm lifting all of these things. These are things just from the last day or two, right? That in the midst of struggle, it's very difficult sometimes to find victories. But what I'm realizing, and I did steal time, I should have put that on my victories. So um, y'all know I believe in meditation and I meditate and um, I don't care if there's deep meditators who think that um, guided meditation is child's play. Look, that's worked for me for years. And so I like Deepak Chopra and I go on choprameditation.com and there's a free meditation that he's doing with um, Alicia Keys right now. And it's um, about harnessing the divine feminine, harnessing the divine feminine. And so 
in the midst of these kind of struggles, I said, you know what, I'm stealing my 20 minutes to do my meditation with Deepak and Alicia Keys, and I'm grounding myself, right? And what I realized coming out of that meditation is that the struggle itself is a victory. Every day that we struggle forward, every day that we commit ourselves to ushering in the kind of world that's in our vision statements, those days of struggle are victory. And so as we think about our victories, and I didn't plan to talk so long um, inviting you to share your victories, I want us to also think about what struggles we're in the midst of and how those are also victories, how committing ourselves to the beautiful struggle that Dr. King talks about is in and of itself a victory. And so with that, I just wanna pause and invite you to offer some of your victories. Who has a victory to share? I'm happy to jump in on this one. Yeah, please. Adam. You know, um, and I, 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 I so appreciate the way you preface this because I think this week I've been also kind of struggling to sit into something that has been a victory for me. My partner and I just closed on our on a house here in South LA, a, a second house for me. Um, the first house I owned has been in my family for over four generations here in South LA and uh, South Central. And so it means a lot for me to be able to really lean into my own personal one now. Um, but I noticed this week when you were talking about you were struggling, I've been struggling to be excited about it. Like I've been like, okay, next thing, let's go. Like trying to remember what it means to really move forward in, in our community, especially with gentrification, with so many things changing. Like I'm already thinking about what's next. And so I'm really sitting in this moment of victory of seeing that even within the struggle of, of um, yeah, and the struggle of sitting within all of this that I also um, want to allow myself some space to really be in the victory of it. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations on that house. Yeah. Um, some in the spirit of Biddy Mason, as they keep coming for Black women homeowners acting like that it's a problem to buy property, let's summon the spirit of Biddy Mason and think about how, you know, those conflicts, right? Yeah, we may not agree with the capitalist system, but there's a degree of autonomy that comes with being mm -hmm. able to buy, especially in our own neighborhoods. Yeah. So congratulations, Ali, and may Biddy Mason spirits smile on you and, yeah. you know, fill your home. Yes. You. Yes. Denise, your hand is raised. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I was able to use my um, privilege as a teacher to help two students pass a class that one faculty actually was trying to get me to withdraw her from the class. And so the student um, fulfilled what she was supposed to do. That made me feel so good inside that I was able to be flexible and she was able to be successful. And then I asked also have getting ready to publish my first solo article. And what's significant about this, I was going back and forth with the editor. They wanted to make black they didn't want to capitalize the B in Black, and I got my stand. Yes, you have to capitalize B, especially in Black, because it's a noun, not an adjective. So, Yes, yes, absolutely. Capitalize the B in Black. Why is that still a fight? I still fight with editors over that as well. And then they made this comment that I couldn't use Caucasian because it was talking about certain people in the mountains or something. And I didn't even use Caucasian, so I don't even know where that came from. But I thought that was odd. But Jen, you're going to talk to me. You're going to like give me a hard time about capitalizing Black. That just seemed kind of hypocritical to me. But you won, right? You won. There we go. That's a victory. Elaine, Elaine, your hand is raised. Hello. Um, first, I just want to thank um, you and Ali and... Um, Yvonne, who have made it possible for us to have this class and everyone who participated, um, Yolanda, sorry, I'm 
misspeaking. Um, so victory for me this week was I've been working with a group of people um, on uh, develop, trying to get a development project um, that's owned by Metro to have more affordable housing. It's called District NoHo up here in North Hollywood. And um, 1500 residential units and right now only 20% of them are going to be affordable and the rest are market and we're trying to change that and so up till now we've been working sort of um, just trying to learn and educate ourselves and get ready and um, we did our first set of letters to the metro board at the meeting last week and are just starting this campaign to try and um, get them to reimagine the housing in this public owned land, really big opportunity, 1500 units is not, um, you don't get that every day. So that was exciting and felt good to be moving to that next phase. That's amazing. That's amazing. So thank you for that work. Um, I think that as you're bringing that up, Elaine, what also is coming for me is please think about our communities as a base of support. So what do you need when you need things to be active, when you need folks to be activated, how do you plug in with this community that we're developing to create pressure when you need to? Um, and so let's all think about how we all contribute to all of these different struggles. We talked about that mosaic, we talked about that stained glass window, right? But remember all of those pains touch each other, right? So as you do work, Remember that the work that we do, even within our own collectives, are also helped and supported by all of the different areas. So please, um, let's all enlist support from one another to, to make sure that we make our victories as impactful as they can be. Is there anyone else? And then I see Yolanda in the chat saying her middle name is Yvonne, so you're actually not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Very kind. <laughs> Is there anyone else um, who wants to share a victory? Can I quickly share something? Yes, please. Um, so I work for on the development side um, of Brilliant Corners and we're working with a community land trust partner um, on acquiring a small site to ultimately have the resident, the land trust will own the land uh, for many, many years. And ultimately the goal is for the tenants to form like a cooperative ownership and take over the property. And we're about to close on it. Hopefully today, looks like everything is in order. So uh, very excited about that. And where is this Vanessa? Uh, it's um, over on Kenmore in like, kind of like the little Bangladesh neighborhood of Los Angeles. Okay. okay. I actually used to live on that street. That's interesting. Yeah. So great. Yeah. It's very great. exciting. Yeah, congratulations, that's great, that's great. Anybody else have anything they wanna share? All right, um, so I think it's really important that we maintain this practice. So this class, during this last class, we're gonna just really kind of talk about what practices we can maintain. I want to, since Yolanda introduced um, history and the role of history and the building of black power. I do wanna give a little bit of historical context, reminding us, you know, there's a chant that we say all the time in Black Lives Matter that when we fight, we win. And it feels really good to say that chant, when we fight, we win, when we fight, we win, when we fight, we win, is what we always say. And I think it's important to remember the history of that, that there is no struggle that Black people or oppressed people have engaged in that we've lost. We've always won every fight that we've engaged in. The only way we lose a fight is to give up the fight. And so when we think about, you know, the push against chattel slavery, right? When we think about people even on the continent of Africa, people like Yasantewa and Queen Nzinga and Shaka Zulu and others, right? Who won fights to push white colonization out. They won those fights. They won those fights. We won those fights, right? When we think about 
um, what happened in Haiti, right? And the Haitian revolution and people like Toussaint L'Ouverture, he invoked every single tool in his toolbox, including spiritual tools, which we didn't talk too much about in this class, but I'd love for us to think about, right? All of your tools should be invoked as you're engaging in these fights, right? So he invoked every single tool and overcame an army, a military force, the French, that really when you measured it, he shouldn't have won, right? We shouldn't have won, but we won that fight. We won the fight against chattel slavery. It took hundreds of years, but we won that fight, right? We won the first um, against the first wave of lynching. When we think about Ida B. Wells and the work of the um, Black club women and Mary Church Terrell and Black women journalists um, and the work that they did, they won that fight, right? They won that fight. Even when we think about legislation on lynching didn't get passed until this year, right? That's a long fight, but they won that fight, right? Civil rights was won. Civil rights were won. Um, black power, black power was won. And I, I don't know if we got into the history of that shift from civil rights to black power. Did we talk about 1965? Remind me if we talked about 1965 as a year. A year of, so I want you to remember the year 1965 as the year that we transitioned from civil rights to black power and what that meant, right? That 1965 marked the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the ushering in of the black power era because as we won all of these victories that were important for the civil rights movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, as we kind of um, empowered black folks in the South and beat back um, de jour racism, right? It was also recognized in cities like Los Angeles that there was an ongoing oppression that really kind of um, challenged this notion that we won. So almost immediately, as we watched the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, we saw the beating of Marquette Fry and his mother and his brother and Watts, right? And so there was this stark contrast between 1965 in the South and the victories that were ushered in by women like Fannie Lou Hamer and um, people who were engaged in the civil rights struggle, right? And then there was also what was happening in urban centers where the police are absolutely contemporary slave catchers, right? Where they absolutely invade and oppress and profile and repress and brutalize and terrorize black community. And so you see this mass uprising in Watts in August, 1965, which really is the ushering in of the black power era. So when civil rights is saying, we want all of the rights, we want government to intervene and protect us from oppressions from local government, from state government, from individual racists. They want, we want them to protect our civil rights, right? And, and the emphasis becomes um, inclusion. What we see in contrast is the fact that the very systems that we're seeking to be included into are corrupt to their core. And so black power really becomes the, the call, the the reclamation of the abolitionism of the 19th century, right? It's saying that we have to upend the systems themselves. And so black power is a more imaginative call that says, we don't wanna be included. We don't wanna be um, brought into what they call the burning house, right? We wanna build new visions, new institutions, new practices. And that's what black power becomes. And so it's important to remember also though, 
that as we struggle for black power, as we struggle for what's more courageous, what's more um, creative, what's more ambitious, um, what's more audacious, that the freedom in Angela Davis's words that we seek is a constant struggle. Freedom is a constant struggle. And so as we remember um, that, you know, there are frustrations, that struggle, that idea that freedom is a constant struggle has to become our mantra, but we have to pause to celebrate the victories as well. So the idea that Garcetti is trying or has restored $40 million in funding to LAPD, it could hit us hard and feel like a loss and feel like a setback, or it could mean that we have to redouble our efforts in the struggle. And so um, Black Lives Matter and the coalition called People's Budget LA is now saying, well, if you look into the city charter in Los Angeles, you can revise the budget at any time. We're calling on city council, especially at a time when Garcetti is supposedly going off to become ambassador to India. You don't owe him nothing. In fact, it's not even, um, shouldn't even be in your political calculation that you owe him something. And so let's revise the budget. Let's cut that other 110 million and let's, continue to dwindle it down from there, right? We're also saying that, um, you know, there are things that are on the table already, like refusing to hire more police that city council member Mike Bonin and Nitya Raman proposed that had never even been taken up by city council. And finally, we're saying, don't be afraid to say black. There is no year of blackness, right? People are acting like that, we've gotten beyond the George Floyd moment. No, the struggle for black freedom is a constant struggle. And so when we say that we want black communities to be empowered, that means making sure that black communities receive funding through black led organizations. And so People's Budget LA is issuing these three demands as of today. It's really important that each of you consider that even as you struggle, the struggle is never lost until you put it aside. Um, and so what I wanted to um, uplift before we get into a little bit of conversation is the way in which we struggle, the way in which we struggle for black power and black lives. My brother from another mother, Kendrick Sampson, says it's not enough to say black lives matter, we have to make black lives matter. So the question becomes, how do we make Black Lives Matter? And the formula that I've developed in addition, and I actually do have one addition that I want you to consider, um, is that we all need to use our voice, our body, and our resources, our voice and our body, our body and our resources for Black power. So using your voice, using your voice, um, what do you think that means to use your voice and how will you commit to using your voice? Did I share this? I shared that, right? Did I share the screen or did I just show it for myself? I think I might've just shown it. You just me. showed it for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me, so this is the voice, the body and the resources, right? How we make Black Lives Matter. Um, so how do you use your voice and how will you commit to using your voice? Let's take a couple of people weighing in on how you use your voice. So it's just chastity. I think, you know, every week when you provide us with um, a call to action and there are petitions that can be signed or phone calls that can be made, um, letters to write, um, you know, there are lots of op-ed pieces that are, are um, um, different publications are happy to receive. So all of those are, are ways that we can use our voices. Absolutely, absolutely. Writing op-eds, Denise just wrote one, right? Um, what else can you do to use your voice? Signing petitions, writing op-eds, what else? Alessandra? 
Hi, it's nice to like meet you in person. I finally got it together to be on camera for this class. Um, I get really bad anxiety being on camera, so this is kind of hard for me. Um, so I've actually been listening and learning from you for about a year now. So I got involved, I live in Toronto, I'm from Trinidad, I live in Toronto now. Um, and last year I started volunteering with an organization called No Pride in Policing Co Coalition. Here they were originally formed to su in support of BLM Toronto. And so um, originally it was to get police out of pride. And now it's about defunding and abolishing the police. So um, now I'm part of their working group. And so we actually have a meeting in about an hour and a half, um, but we are planning a march and a rally on the 27th of this month um, around defunding and abolishing the police. Um, and I might be speaking at it. And so I don't know how that's gonna go, um, but yeah. That's amazing. Voice. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. You didn't want to speak on a Zoom and now you're going to be speaking at this rally. That's awesome. Maybe. Maybe. We'll, we'll see. Oh, I'm hearing that out tonight. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Do you know Sandy Hudson from BLM Toronto? I know of her. I follow okay. her on social media, but I don't know her personally. Okay. That's, yeah, my comrade. She's in UC, at UCLA now, so she's not there, but. I know she comes home regularly. So I think some of the people that she works with, I'm gonna get to meet because um, everything has been virtual, right? For the most part. And so I haven't actually met any, any members of BLM Toronto. Well, when you do tell them all I said, hello. I will. <laughs> That's great. That's great. That's a really clear way of using your voice. Speaking at rallies is a very clear way to use your voice. Um, and organizing with folks, right? Absolutely. What else? Let's get one more on voice. Also, um, just speaking up and out when you're in small groups and see, hear things said, or people supporting things that um, you want to change their minds or stop them on um, so that they actually realize that what they just said was racist um, and just having the courage to do that in small places as well. And sometimes that's harder. Was that Elaine speaking? Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes that's actually harder than being on a stage or writing something, right? Like when it's your own folks, like when it's your colleague who you want to get along with or your neighbor or your um, own family, right? Speaking up in those spaces is really important and um, also often more influential than when you're speaking at a rally because they know and love and respect you. And so sometimes they hear you differently. Um, I don't want to say too much because we're, uh, I want to get, oh, wow, it's 1239. So I, I want to get a lot more in before we wrap this class, but I, I'll just share this, that my next door neighbor is someone who I know and love. Her mother, um, you know, was one of the people who welcomed me into the neighborhood 20 years ago. She's since passed. Both of her parents are passed and she lives in the house and they're like traditional black church folks, right? She sings gospel music. They have like church meetings at their house all the time. And these are not, um, she's a little older, not, she's not an elder, but she's a little older, maybe um, late fifties, early sixties. And these are not normally the kind of people who wind up getting involved in Black Lives Matter. But over the course of the last couple of years, you know, she's seen me and my children and um, she started by asking if she could have her Black Lives Matter t-shirt. So I brought her a t-shirt. But then she started just checking in on little things. And, you know, we'd sometimes bring her um, extra uh, produce bags from our meetings. And finally, she's a beautiful gospel singer. We were doing the closing of New Black City and I said, Kim, would you come and sing for the closing of New Black City? 
and she came out with us on Sunday and she sang so beautifully, but she also offered words of why black, we have to make black lives matter. And so Elaine, when you're saying, you know, don't just speak up on stages, speak in your small circles, speak in those interactions that you have with your neighbors and people that you know and love, each one of those conversations is a seed. And so now I'm tearing up, but um, yesterday I actually got a text from one of her family members who said that they're coming out now, they're gonna start coming out. And so I think it's just so beautiful when we're able to um, be patient and loving with people, but also challenge folks to join the struggle and um, really push them on how imperative it is that we're all involved in whatever way we can be. So thank you for that, Elaine. All right, the, the next thing is body. Um, so what do you think we mean when we say the other way, another tool that we have to make Black Lives Matter is using your body, is your body. What does that mean? Your body. Should I show the Thank picture? For the oh, it, is, it is a pretty picture. Um, <laughs> I think that can mean uh, several things. I think um, it can mean putting your body in spaces where you are, um, you are, you are representing just by being there. Um, and I think it can also mean, especially if you have a black body, then it can mean caring for it. And, mm. Yeah, and healing it and making that a practice in the work because that is a radical, I can't remember, I think it was Audre Lorde that said that beautiful quote about it being a radical self-care and it's a radical act um, for, you know, for people that have black bodies and, and indigenous POC bodies, so. Ashe, Ashe. So showing up and caring for your body um, are two ways in which we use our body to make Black Lives Matter. A lot of times the showing up, people wait for personal invitations, right? Um, and I wanna challenge our group to not wait for a personal invitation. If you see something that's important, um, see it posted, you don't have to know anybody to go. You might discover beloved community just by coming out. And your body does actually make a difference. Um, we've been celebrating victories, but we also have regrets. One of my regrets is not going to Tulsa for the 100th anniversary because I wasn't personally invited. Black Lives Matter wasn't personally invited. And I shortchanged myself and I also shortchanged everybody else by not having a Black Lives Matter presence in Tulsa. I've been to Tulsa, done tours of Greenwood, um, brought a group there in 2015. And why am I waiting for somebody to say you should come? Why didn't I just go? So I regret not going. I don't think anybody ever regrets going, right? When you go and stand for something you believe in, I don't think anybody ever has a regret around doing that. So we just wanna challenge ourselves to say, don't wait for somebody to invite you. If it's something that you believe in, go. Does that make sense? Does anybody else have anything to offer on this question of body and using our bodies? There's something that Saba said that also I think is a challenge um, when we talk about if you have a black body um, that we wanna protect it. And also one of the practices that we have in Black Lives Matter with our ally groups, white people for black lives and showing up for racial justice, um, especially is helping us protect our black bodies. So one of the things that we see at protests is police are much, much more brutal um, against black people than they are anybody else, especially white folks. 
um, we have an elder white woman who we actually call the cop whisperer because she's <laughs> sometimes able to hold them at bay. And when Dahlia and Jason formed White People for Black Lives, it was really about the, the first charge that they had was to put their bodies between us and the police. This is when we were doing a lot of like intersection shutdowns and we're facing a lot of um, repression from police. And they would, um, I remember one of our early demonstrations, we took an intersection and it was all black people at the center, but around us forming a perimeter was all white folks. And we sat down and this is when we were still doing die-ins we did our die-in knowing that there was a perimeter of protection that protected us from police, that protected us from cars. Um, and so when we say your body, we also mean literally your body. How do non-Black folks, especially white folks, use the privilege that comes with whiteness to protect Blackness? Um, so I just wanna offer that as well. Is there anybody else who wants to say anything on that piece? before we move to the resources piece. Um, third, we do wanna talk about resources. And you know, the third way we make Black Lives Matter is through our resources, through our resources. And resources in this picture means dollars, right? And we absolutely mean dollars. Um, I uh, spoke this morning with um, Roland Martin, who's a journalist, Black journalist, and he says we made a fatal error in publishing the Black Lives Matter impact report, um, which said that over the course of the year after George Floyd was murder murdered, we received $90 million in donations because the NAACP received more than $200 million in donations. And so because we published what we received, we became the target for attack, right? People said, what are you doing with all that money? As if it was like a lotto win and we were supposed to spend it all on new cars or something, or, you know, you're not supposed to spend all of the money that you receive, right? So I think we were thinking, well, $90 million is enough to move towards institution building. So of course, you know, we supported organizations who were on the ground and in the midst of struggle, gave $26 million away, um, but there's 60 million re remaining, right? And um, he asked what we're doing, you know, that that he said that people ask what we're doing because we published it. Um, I think he's right to a degree. I think that we should have probably led with Black Lives Matter donates $26 million to black led organizations, not Black Lives Matter receives $90 million in donations. I think that it, uh, most people don't get that, um, you know, uh, receipt doesn't mean that you have to immediately dole it out um, and that there is a need for black institution building. Um, but I also think that it's important and can really lead us into a conversation around how we give resources. And um, there have been a few organizations and a few individuals who recognize that in the grand scheme of things, when you're talking about the largest movement in global history, um, $90 million really isn't that much money. And um, 60 million that we have left definitely isn't that much money. And that in order to build for the long haul, we need to constantly receive funds, right? We need to be in the state of constant receipt. So we're grateful that there's some organizations and individuals that continue to give to Black Lives Matter in order to build it up so we can have a long lasting institution that's around to fight for black freedom until we get it, until we win it, right? And resources means more than money, right? So resources also means what else do you have to offer? What else do you have to offer? Do you have platforms to offer? Do you have space to offer? Um, what else do you have to offer? So I'd invite folks to talk about what they have to offer to the struggle for Black freedom 
and um, how you can use those offerings to make Black Lives Matter connections, Heather says. Heather, you know, I, I spoke about you just the day before yesterday. I don't know if you saw this article, but hey, Tyler, can you hand me that magazine right there? So I'm on the cover of a rock magazine. I don't know if you know this. Um, I feel really accomplished. So Razor Cake Magazine, that's me, right? So it's a, it's a punk rock magazine. And they um, did um, an interview with me and they asked about challenges. And <laughs> thank you, Ali. They asked about challenges. And um, when you talk about connections, they asked about some of the challenges that I faced. And I talked about the accusation around anti-Semitism and the way in which you and Ben the Ark and Rabbi Cohen and so many others have stood and said, you know, this is not anti-Semitism, that, you know, these kinds of um, struggles are important. These kinds of conversations are important. So when you say connections, connections are absolutely important. Um, because they help us to overcome those who would seek to use those same three tactics that have always been used to bring down Black movement, right? Um, the, the murders and assassinations of our people, the criminalization and incarceration of our people, and the discreditation of our people. And so I just want to shout you out, Heather, and say thank you for using your connections always to help the struggle for Black freedom. And I see you on camera, so I don't know if you want to say anything. Hey! hey guys, they're a little bit asleep, but um, yeah, I, it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility and a privilege and an honor to make sure that the truth is told and um, truth should always be what's at the center. And uh, yeah, thanks. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else want to talk about resources? Okay, there's one thing I didn't put on that slide because remember we're in a constant state of evolution and growth, right? And so I've been speaking in terms and thinking in terms of voice body resources, which I hope that you all will all remember and think about how to use. But recently I've come to understand the role of autonomous space and recognizing that we all have spaces of autonomy where we can usher in our visions for the world in those spaces. So we all have space, whether it be a workplace where maybe you have a management or leadership position, whether it be a community organization that you might have um, a position in, or even if it's just your own household. How do you use your autonomous spaces to usher in your vision? So I started thinking a lot about what I attempted to build when I was chair of Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA, that we always had food, we turned our copy room, I, I'm sorry if I've shared this with you before, but we turned our copy room into a student resource room, I encouraged all of our faculty to every semester, even if you're teaching the same classes, order desk copies of your books. So we can have a library for students who can't afford the books. They can come into this back room. They can check out the books. They can read and study together there. But also when we got cash donations at our events, we used that to buy, we kept it stocked with cup of noodles, water and cuties, right? So nobody has to come in and say, I'm hungry. This is your space. Come in and you can live off a cup of noodles and cuties for years if you want to, right? And so students and even faculty, because we got to be real, like some of our part-time faculty are making like $30,000 a year. They're hungry sometimes, right? Come in, nobody ever asks questions and you come in and you use the space. So how can you use autonomous space, your spaces of autonomy to usher in your vision? How can you promise in your own neighborhood, in your own household that you'll never call the police on people, right? What other safety practices can you have? Um, I watched a video on Instagram yesterday where there was a black delivery driver 
um, in a white affluent area in San Francisco. And one of the residents um, asked for his ID, asked where he was going and then threatened to call the police on him. And I watched the delivery driver as he said, y'all keep telling black people to do this and to do that. And I'm just a black man trying to make a living. I'm just a black man trying to make a living. And I want you to think about what it means that you said you're gonna call the police on me and how that brings our deaths. And so we all occupy spaces of autonomy, even if it's just yourself. So how do you embody these visions for freedom that we've all written down, right? And so it's really important that we do that. And I just wanna invite you um, as we move towards the end of class to think about or to offer, maybe three folks can just offer how you plan to use your spaces of autonomy to usher in your vision. Anybody wanna make an offering before we go? It's our last chance. Okay, Denise. I think it's important that we um, not try to get out of jury duty. Hmm. I think George Floyd really brought that to mind now. It's like, I do everything I can to get out of jury duty and I think I'm not gonna do that, especially if I know the person is of color. And the majority are, right? So you're not gonna know before you <laughs> it won't be. Duty. But you yeah. know, the majority of the defendants are people of color and poor people. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody else? What's one thing you're going to do? All right. Well, I want to do your calls to action. Um, can y'all see this? No, I'm doing it again, sharing for myself and not sharing for you. Hold on. Oops, did I hit the wrong thing? There. Um, calls to action. And police associations is again today and every Wednesday, even after class is over at 3 p.m. at 1313 West 8th Street. You can find out more at npoliceassociations.com or just meet me there. I'm there every Wednesday, so is Tyler. Um, this is not a drill on Thursday night. Um, it's gonna be about the new leadership of Black Lives Matter. So I'll be on with the entire grassroots leadership team. Um, so please join, and this is something you can do at home. Just watch on Facebook and meet this incredible team. Our general meeting is this Sunday at Chuko's Justice Center. Um, so if you're interested in joining or allying with Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, please come out. Chuko's Justice Center is at 7625 South Central Avenue. And then finally, if you have a Black young person in your life, our young people have started a political education camp for Black youth that kicks off on Sunday and every Sunday for six weeks during the summer um, at Norman Houston Park. It's free. It's going to end with arts classes. Um, there's free food and it's um, directed by the Black Lives Matter Youth Vanguard. People can sign up at tinyurl.com slash BLM Youth Camp. Um, you know the quick things you can do right now, including signing that petition to free Rochelle McGee, who's now the longest serving political prisoner in the United States. And so we want to encourage you um, to stay involved, to make Black Lives Matter. And I'm very, very grateful to have had this last eight weeks with you. And I pray that you'll stay connected with me and with the movement and that we will um, continue in this new iteration of Black Power work. I can take any questions or thoughts before we go. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Bula. I will just also jump in and say, and let's let everyone know 
um, as a reminder that for those of you who contributed, whether you did or not, doesn't matter. Um, but everything that uh, we've created within these ex these eight weeks that Dr. Abdul has brought to us, um, all the funds are being like, split between SVP and taking care of like the back office stuff and also going to Black Lives Matter as well. So just wanting to know, wanted you to know that your involvement here continues to support the movement as best as we can. And um, just really appreciating everyone for just stepping in and being a part of this. We hope to really continue spaces like this um, and hopefully even having Dr. Bill back to continue these, these necessary conversations. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Ali. I'm really, again, grateful to have had this space with you. And I hope to come back too. I know I owe you an email. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you for all your work. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you.